Welcome to the International Day of Light. We hope everyone is logging in right now. We're going to give it just a minute for our attendees to show up. I can't see very well. Oh, I've got the light glasses on. <laughs> hope you're excited about the International Day of Light. We're here to celebrate that. We're going to let everyone introduce themselves. I am August Burns, the business manager for the Duke Fitzpatrick Institute for Photonics, which is just a fancy word, fancy phrase that Fitzpatrick Foundation donated the money for our institute. And the institute is a group of people at Duke that involves scientists, engineers, chemists, and doctors all to work together to solve problems using light, which is what photonics is, the study of light and matter. So I'm gonna go over a few logistics here. Um, due to minor safety, there will only be three of us live here. And that is myself, Joy, and Vanessa. And that is because we have gone through background checks. We have gone through safety training for minors and this is for the protection of minors. So we ask that all of our attendees use the chat, which you should find on your Zoom webinar. And you can ask us questions and we will be here live to answer any of those questions. So now I'm gonna ask Joy and Vanessa to introduce themselves. Vanessa, go ahead and start us off. Sure, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Vanessa Cupel Garcia. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Dr. Tuan Vodin's group. Hi everyone, I'm Joy and um, I'm also a second year PhD student in Dr. Tuan Vodin's group, and I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Thanks, Joy and Vanessa. And now we're going to have a special welcome message from Dr. Vodin, who is the director of the Institute. And later we're going to have a special message from the UNESCO or United Nations Steering Committee Chair for the International Day of Light. He will be near the end of our program. And our program should last about an hour and a half through different demo, so I'm hoping you'll stay with us through that. Hello, everybody. My name is Tuan Verdin, director of the Fitzpatrick Institute for Photonics at Duke University. Today is May 16, a very special day. I'm, I'm very excited to welcome you to our Institute annual meeting and celebrate with us this day May 16, which is declared by UNESCO as one of the most important day, the International Day of Light. The International Day of Light is the most exciting global initiative for the whole world to recognize and appreciate the importance of light in science, in culture and art, in education and in sustainable development. Indeed, light plays a very crucial role in many fields spanning medicine, communications, and energy. So today we have for you a very exciting celebration program. I hope you will enjoy our planned activities and wish you a wonderful celebration of life. Thank you. International Day of Light contest winner is. And Vanessa, if you want to tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll announce who the winner is. Yes. So we created this contest, uh, open to all high school students in the area. Um, 
basically anywhere in North Carolina and also outside of um, our state. And for the competition, the students had to submit a photo uh, capturing how does light change the world. And after uh, receiving um, a couple of submissions, we came to our decision um, on who the winner is. And so I'm, the winner is a ninth grade student from West Carteret High School in uh, Carteret County, North Carolina. And here is the picture, congratulations. Um, and I'm going to read the caption submitted with the photo. And the caption reads, light changes our world because it allows us to see the world through a new perspective. Oftentimes it is one that is more beautiful and allows us to find beauty in unexpected places. An example of this is my picture. Most people would look at a pool and see a dirty, filthy, large bathtub filled with chlorine germs. However, when we shed light onto it, it allows us to see the true beauty of the pool. It is a sparkling blue pool where stress is relieved where children and adults alike come to have fun in a place of exercise for athletes and non-athletes. As a swimmer, I constantly find myself at the pool pra practicing oftentimes early in the morning before the sun has come up. During practice, I watch the sun come up and light slowly seep through the window sills of the pool. There are mornings when the only reason I practice is to see light in the beauty that quickly follows suit. The light provides a fresh perspective, a perspective that brings with, positive, with it positivity and relaxation. Both of these feelings stay with me throughout my school day. Congratulations to our winner. We uh, have your email, so we'll contact you uh, directly uh, about your first place prize, which is an iPad. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Duke Fitzpatrick Institute for Photonics International Day of Light. My name is Vanessa Cupel Garcia, and I am part of Dr. Tuan Rodin's research group here at Duke. And our lab studies nanoscience and the uses of nanoparticles. And nanoscience is the study of very, very, very tiny materials. And fun fact, the COVID-19 vaccine actually utilizes a lipid-based nanoparticle. In other words, a small, small capsule of fat. And today I will be walking you through uh, a demonstration using light and scanning electron microscopes, using samples that were provided to us by the Boys and Girls Club here in Durham. And the middle school students have pri provided us with a variety of samples and I'll be uh, analyzing three of them today in the demonstration. And first, I would like to talk to you about how um, these microscopes work. Here at uh, Duke University, we have the Shared Materials Instrumentation Facility that has a variety of equipment and microscopes that scientists use in their research. And the electron microscopes help us see um, things that we can't normally see with our eye. So our eye is limited um, in the things we can visualize. Of course, we can see things on the order of several meters. And for reference, a meter is about three feet. But when it gets down to millimeters, um, we can see things that are small, like fibers, dust, or our hair. But anything smaller than that, we need your standard light microscope that you may have used in your science classes. So light microscopes help us see things that make us sick, like bacteria and pathogens. Um, and also the thickness of our hair, which we will actually be looking at today, and things like our blood cells. Of course, in this universe, there are, th there are things that are much smaller than that. And for that, we need more powerful microscopes known as electron microscopes. And those help us look at things like viruses, the DNA found in our cells, proteins, molecules, and atoms. So we talked about electron microscopes, but what exactly is an electron? So electrons are on the outside of atoms and they're negatively charged. And we're able to move them through wires and circuits to generate the electricity that powers our devices like our computers and our phones. And most importantly, they're very tiny. So they're smaller than the wavelength of light. So we can see things that are even smaller and we can see them in much better detail or resolution. 
So here at the Shared Materials Instrument Facility, or SMIF, there are many microscopes. There's light microscopes, scanning electron microscopes, and transmission electron microscopes. And today we'll be um, using the first two. So how is an electron microscope different than a light microscope? Well, in a light microscope, the source of illumination is a lamp that generates uh, photons or packets of light. And in the scanning electron microscope, um, the source that per helps us see the image are electrons found in a filament. And then to um, direct the light to our sample, in both we need some type of mechanism. So in the light microscope, we use lenses that focus the light. And in the scanning electron microscope, we use electromagnets that direct the path of the electrons onto our sample. And because electron microscopes require electrons, the material that's analyzed or looked at must be conductive. So to make our samples conductive, here at Duke, we coat them in gold using a sputter. And a sputter is this instrument shown here in the middle, and it has this mesh at the top made out of gold. And here we, we coated this uh, insect in gold. And how we do this is by pushing gas, in this case, argon gas, into the chamber. So you can think of the gas as a bag of popcorn and the chamber as a microwave. So when you put popcorn in a microwave, um, it heats up and it, the kernels move um, everywhere as they are turned into your fluffy popcorn. Well, here, when the argon atoms in the gas are energized, they turn into this plasma that you see here glowing in purple. And so these energized argon atoms hit the gold mesh and knock off the gold atoms onto the sample. Similar is how a bag of popcorn, the popcorn goes everywhere, knocking onto the sides of the bag. So then the sample is coated in gold. And I've actually already coated our samples for today. So I will show you what our samples look like before coating and after coating. And I'll show you the two microscopes we'll be working with. So this right here is our light microscope. And here are our three samples. And we're going to turn on the light microscope so we can see. And over here, we have our scanning electron microscope. It's this blue machine. And our samples are inside of this chamber. Samples are on top of this disc right here, and you can see that they are coated in gold already. So to get the microscope working, we close our chamber, and we can move our sample in different directions using these knobs. And we turn on the vacuum, and we can turn the vacuum. So now we're going to analyze our three samples using the light microscope. So this software here is, um, is showing you the light microscope. It has a camera on one of the eyepieces of the microscope. So we're looking at the piece of paper um, from an old book. And right now we're out of focus. So if I move the objective by turning a knob, here we can see the paper much more defined, and we can see some of the fibers that the paper is made out of. But of course, we can't get down to the uh, smaller structures. Similarly, if we look at our second sample, and right now I'm, I'm fancier microscopes actually have um, automatic stages you can move and here I'm moving it manually with my hand. So this is the piece of wall and again I have to adjust the focus by moving the objective. 
All right, and on this piece of wall, we can see it's been painted the color white, and we can see some of the grains and texture of the wall. And the last sample we're looking at is a piece of hair. So we can see some of the, um, see that this piece of hair is curly. Let me see if I can show you more of it. Yep, so right here, you can see that it's curly. We see that it's a brown color. But with this light microscope, we really can't see any more than just like the general structure of our samples. So we're going to switch over to the scanning electron microscope and see what we see with that more powerful microscope. The first sample we're looking at here is the piece of paper from an old book that our middle school student found on the ground. And we are analyzing it right now with our scanning electron microscope. And this brings up this software here. And this software controls the microscope. So if you remember the light microscope, I was manually moving everything and I was showing you the images. Well, here to focus um, and to increase our magnification, or in other words, zoom in like you would on a camera, um, we use these mag magnification buttons. And we also have buttons to adjust how bright the image is, the contrast. And we also have a snifty scale bar here at the bottom. So this scale bar tells us how big this image is in real life. So this scale bar right now shows that it's at one millimeter. So for example, an ant that you would find outside is five millimeters long. And the image we're looking at right here, according to the scale bar is one millimeter. So the piece of paper here, you can see um, not only the fibers on the exterior, but we can also see more of the cellulose fibers here, which is something we couldn't see with the light microscope. And if we increase magnification, we can see them in much finer detail. So you can see the separations between them where they're overlapped. And because this is paper um, and it's already been condensed down and the cellulose is packed, we see it like this. But if this was um, a piece of bark or a piece of tree, we would be able to see the cells. And we can zoom out some more and we can move the sample by adjusting the stage. So here we can move right and we can see more of this piece of paper and you would never think a piece of paper would look this cool under a microscope with all these different patterns and so this is our first sample on the screen right now we have our second sample which is the piece of wall and right now we're 60 times magnified on the light microscope when i showed you the samples we were twice or 2x uh, magnification. So right now we're 30 times more magnified than previously. We can see here our sample. And then back here, you're probably wondering what this is with these holes. So this is a uh, carbon uh, tape that's uh, sticky on both sides. So it can stick to our spun sample holder and to our sample itself and both of them actually get coated when we put them in the sputter and the gold coating is around 10 nanometers so a nanometer is a millionth of a of a millimeter and for reference um your dna if you measure it across the skinny side it's at 2.5 nanometers so this is what the piece of wall looks like under 60x magnification so if we use our microscope um, to magnify much more. So right now we're 800 or even like a thousand times magnified. We can autofocus. And so it's really nice that the instrument or machine and our microscope um, autofocuses. So here we can see the paint pigments that are on this piece of wall or drywall. 
And we can see how they dried um, onto the sample. And they have this really cool structure where they're cubic and they're all these different shapes. They say that watching paint dry is really boring, but I really like looking at this paint picture. If you looked, if you showed this to me um, out of the blue, I would not have been able to tell you that this was paint. And here, the nice thing about the software is that we can also save our images. And so this captures the image kind of like a camera would when you click on the capture button or the uh, take button. So here it's capturing the image and it looks much better than the live version. And we can see a lot more detailed structure and part of our hair. And here we can save it. So this is uh, our last sample. And with the SEM, you can analyze a variety of samples as long as they're dry and not wet um, because they have to be dry to go into the microscope. So you could look at leaves, insects, flowers, basically anything you can find in nature, a spider's web, um, a piece of rock or a piece of dirt. Um, and now that we've analyzed our image, we've zoomed in and out using the magnification, we can take a picture of our image that we can save and look at later. So by pressing the save button, it's similar to what you do on a camera when you press on the capture or the take button and it takes your image. And in this case, once it um, takes the image, it compiles all those fast scans you were seeing earlier. So that's why this looks a lot better than the live image. And so you can see more of the structures and uh, parts of our hair and what I was talking about with these more scale-like looking structures. And with spinning electron microscopy, you can actually look at um, more of a very diverse set of samples, as long as they're dry and not wet, because they need to be dry to go into the microscope. So you could look at anything you can find, like leaves, insects, flowers, rocks, dirt, um, and things that you can find on um, inside too, like pencil shavings um, and rubber or plastic. So these are all the images we're taking today. And these are some of the samples that were um, submitted to us. Thank you so much to everyone who joined the seminar. Um, I encourage you to stick around for the other demonstrations. And if you have any questions, I will be here. And thank you so much for coming. We have a sponsor, which is Light Painting Brushes, and I'm going to give you a special message from our sponsor.
Hello everyone, my name is Jason Page and I am a light painter. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you very much to everyone at Duke University for having me and allowing me to share my passion for light painting with you. If you're not familiar with what light painting is, I use light itself as my medium to create my artwork. I go within a three-dimensional space and I paint just as a traditional painter or someone that might draw except I'm using light instead of the more traditional mediums of something like paint or ink. The light painting artwork is captured using the photographic technique of long exposure photography. I always like to compare light painting with traditional painting in that the camera is simply the canvas that is capturing the movement of light through space and over time just as a traditional canvas would capture the brush strokes of an oil or acrylic painter. I hope that the images and the videos that we share with you today inspire you to see light itself as a medium for your own artistic vision. Again, thank you very much for having me and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Right now, I'm going to also share in the chat room here. Hopefully, all of you can find your way through the chat room. I'm going to give you some links here to um, get to light painting brushes tutorial because I think that's really, really going to give you a lot of your tools here of what you need. And let me pull up light painting tutorials. I'm going to put it in the chat here. So if you want to go and look at that tutorial while we're doing this, I will also share the screen with you for those that might have trouble getting to the chat. I'm going to share this screen with you. And so this is our sponsor, Light Painting Brushes here. And in this, they've got their tutorials here. You've got all the tutorials from beginning. And I'm just going to show you a few things with the tools in the next couple of videos but here are the tutorials. This is the equipment you'll need, how to do your first light painting. They even explain how to focus in the dark. And for me, I needed to know like the camera settings. I'm, I wasn't a professional photographer. So how do you set the f-stop, the ISO, and what are those things? They can share those tips with you directly on this website. So I'm not gonna go into all of that detail but I'm gonna show you a video of some of the cool tools that you can use to do light painting. You ready to light paint? If you love light, this is gonna be fun. So you need three main things. You need some sort of camera or smartphone, some sort of tripod. If you don't have a tripod, you can use something like books and stand your phone up. And then you're gonna need, whatever it is, you need to be able to do long exposure. So either with your camera, there's apps that you can do long exposure with your phone. So that's the next thing you need is a flashlight or something that emits light that you can paint with. So now I'm gonna go over some of the things that we use to light paint with. You get as creative as you want. You can use just a simple flashlight and just show light at the camera and you can still paint with that. Now I'm gonna come back tonight and we're gonna demonstrate a lot of this. But I wanted to show you during the daytime what some of these things look like. Cause I wanna thank Light Painting Brushes for sponsoring us and giving us some tools to work with to light paint. They are a great company to get a startup kit if you want like professional tools to do your light painting. All right, so the one thing that makes their kit so cool is this thing called the universal connector what that does is it allows a standard flashlight to go in here and then to hook to any of their little toys here like this is what we call a light pin and it screws on so i can use this to write with and i'll show you tonight how that looks but you can write your name with this all right so then you take this off and say you want to do a lightsaber or a light sword, you screw the universal connector back onto this. And then you can make 
cool little designs with this. Again, I'll show you all that fun stuff tonight. So again, with this universal connector, it fits also a water bottle. Just your standard water bottle. So you can put lights in here and do even cool stuff. Again, you're gonna get some fun effects. So it allows you to work with any bottle. This is what we call a portrait lens. So I'll show you, it'll light your subject up when you run that over them. We've got the light pins. Here's another thing that you're probably gonna learn about is fiber optics, where light travels from the flashlight into the ends of these. So you'll get to see how that works tonight. And then they can even make cool things because this is a unicorn rod. And again, we screw it into the connector here. And then we're gonna shine light and that's gonna make some neat effects that we're gonna get to see later. Here's another thing they have called a hood. And this just lights up the area. You again, put that on and you can light up the ground. That color is orange. I've got another color here, purple. So that's all kind of stuff from light painting brushes. Then I've taken your universal connector and I took just a PVC pipe I drilled some holes in it to see what that would do and then put this little piece on and this makes some cool light effects. This is the great thing about light painting. You get to create your own tools and find out how it creates. Here's another thing I did at our 3D printing collab. I cut out a piece of plastic here and I even painted it blue with a Sharpie and I used this universal connector and I can make cool little signals with this. Makes like a triangle effect. So that's a lot of the stuff we'll use tonight. Here's another thing that emits light. It's called a fiber fly, or some people call it a light whip. It looks like a whip, like horse whip. And it's all fiber optics. And you turn this light on and it has all different colors. It makes crazy patterns too. That's a popular thing with light painting. And then I had a friend that showed me about how to make orbs. You can just spin something around like this in a circular motion and just turn around and you can get like an orb effect. But that's not gonna be perfect. And I wanted it perfect. So I asked this other light painter how they did the orbs and he showed me something where he had an old crank from an old car and these rods, and I couldn't understand it all. So I got my brother-in-law to look at this, and he does a little machine shop work, and he made this for me. Now, of course, all the light painters want one, but he promised me he was only doing it for me, and then that was it. So I can't get one of these for all the other light painters, but you can design your own. And basically, it's that same concept. You have a rod, that turns around and it has a light at the top and you can even put one at the bottom. And I have something that holds on to it. So then we put another ball on this. Sorry, I'm going all around in circles. And I'm using a combination of a light painter's kit that he makes these balls for. And we put it on, we mounted it on this rack and you can even see we used a USB button here to turn the switch on. Lots of cool things, as creative as you want. And I'll show you this fun thing tonight. And there's one more item that I haven't shown you that I've seen a lot of light painters use, and that's called the Magilite. And particularly my friend Jess Kruger and her husband Andy, they like to do that with science images. Jess Kruger is in Dr. Mark Summers' group. And they work with a lot of monkeys, they work with mice, and they see a lot of neuron images of the brain. So you're going to see that in some of the light painting. And basically what they do with that Magilite, it's, it's similar to this long light like this sword. And they program in a picture. And that picture, then they can just take that and light paint it across the wall, and you have that image of that science image. The other thing the Magilite can do in these swords, you can do circular motions, which are kind of cool. 
So I'll show you some of those techniques tonight. And I'm just going to go over a few basics, but the light painting brushes, whether you use their tools or not, they give you great tutorials on that site from everything from taking your first light painting photograph to using a cell phone to how to paint a flower, how to paint a light paint of a person. They show you all these cool techniques and that's where I got a lot of my experience from. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this. Come back more for the light painting tonight. Thank you. We're ready to light paint. It's night time. I've got a fire going here just to give us a little light here on the situation. So you wanted to see what some of these toys look like at night. All right, again, you see this is that universal connector that I was telling you about that we're gonna screw into some things. So these are the light pins that I was showing you. I'm gonna screw in the universal connector. Then we'll put my light with it. And you can see I could write my letters here, you cut it off, write another letter. And the thing about writing with these, you gotta write backwards. So we'll show you some examples, pictures of what that looks like. This is a little toy here just a little light toy that I have, but you can do different things and spin it around. Get some good little side effects out of that. All right, and the fiber optics, people are wanting to see that. We've got a red color on it here. And again, I need to put the universal connector on it. And see how it comes out with red at the end here. And you can do little Things like this around your model. Let's see any other. Oh, another thing was the lightsaber. You want to see what the lightsaber looks like. Put the universal connector on. Ta da! You get all kinds of cool effects with the lightsaber, like this. And then I had told you about the hood, which shines light down on your ground or your background, whatever that would be, the woods. Here's an orange hood. It's got an orange color filter in it. I'm going to put the universal connector on it. And then I can shine like here on the table. You see how it's the orange light? I'd be lighting that surface up. These are all little techniques you can use for the light painting. I mentioned about the portrait mode. Again, hook it to the universal connector. And this you would use on your model. So you would roll it over their face and you would light them up. Again, all of these things are working with the camera on long exposure. And once you get done drawing with the light, you see what that looks like. So I'll be back in a minute and I'll show you how some of it works on the camera. So you ready to try out the orb maker? All right, this is that homemade orb maker where you have a crank here that turns it. You have a middle section here where this is a rod on the end that spins around while I hold this handle. So I'm gonna turn and spin. Now I mentioned that you could put lights on the end. You could put lights anywhere on this. We put something from an artist called Dennis Smith. He does the ball of light. That's on the end here. And I'm gonna turn it on so you can see what it looks like. So that little ball is one way of doing it. But if you don't wanna use other people's artwork, here is what I call a little bicycle light. It goes on the handlebars, latches around. If you can zoom in on that. I'm gonna turn it on. You see it even blinks, which can do other cool effects. But I'm gonna wrap this around. So it's now on my orb maker. And it's in the middle. As a matter of fact, I think I'm gonna do something kind of cool and leave this homemade piece. And I'm gonna turn the bottom piece on. We're gonna have different Kind of lights and see what they do here. 
All right, so pause and then we'll come back. All right, I'm starting the long exposure. I've already done my focusing. And I'm gonna do two different things. I'm gonna do a flashy, blinky light. I'm also gonna turn on the ball of light. And now we're gonna spin it around and see what we create with this. I go around the full cycle. Sometimes, depending on how you want your lights to look, you can go two or three times around in the circle. Stop this. We're going to see what the exposure looks like right now. So I'll stop the exposure. And let's see what we have. And because I did a smaller orb, I moved the little light in closer to the center. It makes it look like there's an orb within another orb. So you can get creative and see what you want to do. Thanks for joining us. All right, so that I did not go through all of the demonstrations of the light toys because we could have been here for another hour. But I'm going to quickly show you some PowerPoint images of different things that can be created with what some of the light painters have done in the group here. And I'm going to share my screen again. So this is a technique that a light painter taught me of how to use the lightsaber. And I did a circle behind the model and then I went out to the side and that homemade pipe I did that had drilled holes in it, they made the stripes down here. It was weird to me that even though it's a white pipe, when you put light in it, it makes orange. And then where the light holes were, it made the streaks. It was kind of cool. This is using a flower with a lightsaber. You just twirl around in a circle. There's a tutorial bis on the light painting brushes. And again, over here is that pipe that I made where I just uh, took the PVC and shined a flashlight in it. And I drilled a few holes and it made those stripes that are white light. This is uh, Jess Kruger's artwork where she's the one that works in the lab where she deals with the neurons. She took that neuron and programmed it in the Magilite and put it next to these trees because she thought they favored each other. So she wanted to do that artwork. She likes to put the science out in nature. And this is in her lab where she had it on her computer and then she light painted it on the wall. This is where she did a light painting at the Fitzpatrick building. This is our building where we do some of the cool research. And she basically took those neurons, put them on that Magilite and walked around that area and it made this beautiful effect. There we took our FIP logo and they used the Magilite and painted this on our building. So they basically took that long light and just walked in a straight line across the building. Now this looks like it's simple to do this sometimes, but as you'll find with some light painters, if you like perfection, you're gonna keep doing it and keep doing it. So Jess on this picture, where Duke is right here at the edge of this column, we had it a little to the side one time and it's like, no, no, do it again. And so you find one picture, you might've taken 30 minutes to get that one shot, just like you like it. And they did this one of me sitting down with the logo in front of the building. And this we did on an old steel bridge where they used the pins that we showed you and they spelled out day of light. And again, we had to write it in reverse because the camera reverses the, um, the light that we write. And Joy, I'm not sure, but you may go over some of the refresh, reflection and refraction and that may be in that little technique that we talk about later. Here's some more orbs and they use bicycle wheels to make these domes on the bottom. So I, again, once you connect with the light artists, if you're interested in this, they can show you all kinds of techniques. 
This is Jess Kruger did this out at the lake. They use a fiber optic, the, it's called that light whip. They use that to drag around the water and they used a sword to basically do the orb here in the center. Really cool stuff. So I, I highly recommend them. And here's another one, last one here. This is at the Duke Chapel where I used the orb maker with the ball of light tool on it and got a beautiful orb there at the Duke Chapel. And some people have asked me, they said, can we go see those lights at the chapel? It's like, no, it's a long exposure. You won't see it when you're there. And you got to see that when I did the light painting at the night, how it spins. And that's what you see with your eye, but the, the camera or your iPhone captures this beautiful artwork. So now that's it for the light painting. We're gonna dive back into some of the science, but I did want to let you know that Light Painting Brushes has donated a gift card, a $100 gift card for one of our attendees today. So we're gonna do that drawing at the end of Dr. John Dudley's message. But right now we're gonna give it over to Joy to um, see if she wants to teach us a little bit about light. Hi everyone, my name is Joy. I'm a second year PhD student in Dr. Tuan Bodin's lab. And today I'm super excited to show you guys a couple of quick experiments that you can do with things you might have laying around the house. So let's get started. So for the first one, all you're gonna need is a bowl, a coin, and some water. So first, you're going to want to take your coin and put it inside the bowl. Somewhere you can see it slightly. And then you're going to move the bowl back until you can no longer see the coin at all. And now we're going to add water to the bowl and watch closely what happens to the coin. You can't see it right now, but... Look at that. The coin didn't move at all, but now you can see it. So that's pretty cool. Let's talk about um, why that would be. So this trick is called appearing coin. Of course, since you add water and it appears. So going on to looking at the coin in the empty bowl. Remember, we moved the bowl back so that we can no longer see the coin. So what's happening there is um, when we try to draw straight rays of light from the coin to the eye, we see that it's actually blocked by the side of the bowl. And so, you know, we can't see the coin because the bowl is in the way. But then what happens when we add water? So when we add water, the light from the coin travels in a straight line like it did before in the water. But once it reaches where water turns into air, it is bent or refracted. And because it's bent, it kind of goes, is able to go over the side of the bowl so that you can now see the coin. but the coin hasn't moved. So where, does our, where do our eyes think the coin now is? Um, that's an interesting question. So actually our eyes think that all light travels in straight lines, even though in reality, as you see here, it doesn't always, it can be refracted, it can be bent, um, but our mind doesn't know that. So it always thinks that light travels a straight, in a straight line and it only remembers the last direction of light that it sees. So in order to find out where we actually think the coin is, we need to trace back from the last arrow that reaches the eye in a straight line like this, like the dotted lines show. 
because of course our eyes only think that light travels in a straight line and it doesn't think that it bends right here. So it actually thinks that the coin is higher, like it's kind of floating in the water, which is pretty cool. So we successfully tricked your mind um, by adding water, bending the light and making it think that the coin is actually higher in the bowl than it actually is. And that's why you can see it. So this concept of refraction is very cool and it's seen a lot in nature as well. So just to recap, refraction is when light bends or changes direction when it passes from one medium or substance like air to another medium or substance like water. And so why does it change direction? Well, it's because there's a difference in the density between air and water um, because water is more dense than air. And because of the difference in the density, light actually travels at different speeds. So it travels slower in denser mediums like water or maybe glass or something like that, than, and it travels faster in a um, less dense medium like air. And so when it switches between the two mediums, it changes speed and therefore changes direction. So the concept of refraction is also really cool because it explains some optical phenomenon in nature, like mirages. So a mirage, you see a picture here. Um, it's when you see an object above or below where it actually is. Um, so you can kind of see this in this picture. I'm not sure if um, you've ever noticed this on a hot day um, in the car, but sometimes when you look in front at the road in front of you, it will look kind of wet like this um, and kind of blue like it's water. So let's uh, take a look at why that happens. So actually, um, it's due to the refraction of different um, layers of different density air. So this um, particular wet road phenomenon that you see happens um, when usually in the summer when the road gets really hot from the sun. So the air that's very close to the road like these layers down here are much warmer than the layers above it because it's not been heated up by the sun. Um, and of course, um, you may know that warm air rises and cold air sinks. And that's because of the difference in density that they have. And we just learned that um, different density uh, materials will refract or bend light. So in this case, light tends to bend away from warm air and towards the cold air. So let's see what happens to a ray of light that comes from the sky. So as it gets to the layers of warmer and warmer air, it bends away from the warm air upwards and to your eye. So um, what you're seeing, of course, is light from the sky. But where are you, where do you think that it's coming from? Um, like I mentioned before, we, um, our eyes only think that light travels in straight lines. So in order to see where we think the light is, we have to draw a straight line from the last arrow that reaches the eye, like this. So you can see that we actually think the light from the sky is coming from the road. And you can kind of see that in the picture, like the road, it looks kind of blue, it matches the shade of the sky. And so we're actually seeing the sky, but on the road. It's almost a reflection, but not quite.
So there's actually another kind of mirage. So in the previous mirage, um, we saw that the sky was lower than it actually was. And in this kind of mirage, we see this ship that is uh, much higher than it is. It looks like it's levitating. Is it magic? No, it's refraction. It's the magic of physics. Um, so let's see how this one happens. So in this case, instead of having cold air above warm air, we have the opposite. So we have warm air above cold air. And of course, um, light still wants to travel, a, uh, bend away from warm air and towards cold air. So if we look at the light rays coming from the ship, as it goes upwards towards the cold, uh, warmer and warmer air, it bends away from the warmer air and towards the colder air to reach your eyes. But again, your eyes only think that light travels straight. So we have to trace back the last arrow that reaches the eye in a straight line to see where we actually think the ship is. And we see that if we trace it back, the ship will look like it's floating. So it's really a trick that your mind plays because the light is being bent by the different temperature air, but your mind doesn't know that. It just thinks that light travels straight and you end up seeing a levitating ship, which is pretty awesome. So another phenomenon that refraction um, explains is why stars twinkle. So um, looking at the Earth's atmosphere, it has different densities because of the different temperatures and different gases in the atmosphere. And they're not perfect layers, but they still are able to refract light. And so if you think of light from a star coming into the Earth's atmosphere, it's refracted this way and that until it reaches your eye. Um, but the catch is that your, the atmosphere is constantly shifting and moving. And so the path that the light takes from a star from one second to the next is slightly different. So because the atmosphere is changing constantly. And so one second, it will take this path and you see the light maybe slightly shifted to one direction. And then the next second, the atmosphere changes, the light takes a slightly different path and you see the um, light maybe slightly shifted again. And the light that was there before stops and that's the twinkle that you see. So the same concept of refraction explains why the coin reappears in the bowl, why stars twinkle, and why mirages happen, why you can see floating ships. So let's move on now to the next um, experiment. So for the next experiment, you're going to need a glass cup, or you could use a two liter bottle, anything that's clear and has relatively straight walls that um, will hold water. Some paper or cardstock, a marker, and some water, of course. What we wanna do is draw two arrows, or just one arrow on this sheet of paper and place it behind the glass. I have it all set up here. And note which direction the arrows are pointing. They're both pointing that way. So now I'm gonna slowly add water to the glass. Look at that, the arrows switch directions. 
So now they're pointing in opposite directions. And if we fill it all the way up, they will both switch. Look at that. Okay, so here are the two cases. On the top, you have the empty cup with the arrow pointing to the side. It looks like it's pointing to um, up because we are looking at um, the experiment from the top, but it's pointing to the side. Um, and then the bottom case is when the cup is filled with water. Um, so in order to illustrate what the light is doing here, we're gonna track the path of the light from the very top of the arrow and also the path of the light from the very bottom of the arrow here. So we're looking at the light, how the light travels from either end of the arrow. So then if or when the arrow flips, we'll be able to see that in the light paths. So let's look first at the um, cup that's empty. So here I've drawn two arrows um, representing the light that's from the top tip of the arrow and from the butt of the arrow. And of course the light travels straight until it's hit something like we've established before. So once it hits the cup, because it's empty, um, you're going from air to air. You're not going from um, air to water. And because the mediums are the same, the light basically travels straight through the cup and towards your eyes. So your eye sees the same arrow pointing in the same direction. But what about the case where the cup is full of water? So again, the light from the tip and the butt of the arrow travels straight until it hits the glass. And now we are going from air to water. And so there's gonna be a larger refraction and there's, the light's going to be bent. So that's what we see. And the direction the light's bending in depends on the um, two medium. So in this case, it's going from air to water that affects how it's bending. And also um, the curvature of the glass and the angle at which the light hits the glass also changes um, the way that the light is bent and refracted. So now the light um, travels, the refracted light travels through the water in a straight line, but at the refracted angle um, until it hits the other end of the glass. So because this is another transition from two different media, so from water to air this time, the light will be refracted again. And when it refracts, you can see that the two rays actually cross each other. So the light from the tip of the arrow ends up um, where the butt of the arrow was, and the light from the butt of the arrow ends up where the tip of the arrow um, was. So that means that what you see is the arrow flipped. So actually, this is something you can add on to the experiment at home. If um, you look at the arrow very close to the glass, before the rays have crossed over, the arrows will point in the same direction that it did when the cup was empty. So this point where the um, two light rays cross is called the focal point. So um, if you are behind the focal point, you will see the arrow upside down. But if you are in front of the focal point, you'll still see the arrow right side up. So feel free to try that at home. So moving on to our next demo, we're gonna make a light fountain. This one I think is really fun. 
So all you're gonna need is a empty two liter bottle, soda bottles or any other plastic large bottle would work. You'll need something sharp like a nail, um, or in this case, I have a small screwdriver, something that will be able to poke a small hole into this. And then lastly, you'll need some water and a flashlight. I'm gonna use my phone again, or a laser pointer if you have. So first, you're gonna take your sharp object and poke a small hole towards the bottom of the bottle. And I chose this spot. You wanna to try to make the hole round and kind of small so that you get a nice um, regular stream once we fill this up with water. All right, so for our next steps, I'm gonna to head to the sink because it might get a little messy. All right, so. So the next step to do by a sink is to fill up the two liter with water. And of course, once the water level gets above the hole, it's going to leak out through this hole. And you can block it with your finger or you can just let it be. I'm gonna block over. So once it's pretty full, you can cap the bottle. Once you cap the bottle, the water should not really leak out from the hole. Okay, so what we're gonna do is loosen the bottle cap. Once I loosen the bottle cap, the water will stream out from the hole that we made and I'm going to shine my flashlight into the water and see if the light can go into the stream. So let's unscrew the bottle cap. And you see the stream there immediately. You can control the flow of the stream by loosening and tightening the bottle cap. And then we're going to take our flashlight and shine it behind. And watch the stream. Can we turn off the light? Isn't that cool? I can still and close the bottle cap. The light seems to be trapped in the water. And we can also try the laser pointer. So you wanna aim the laser pointer from behind at the opening of this, of where the water comes out. There you go. Can see that the laser light follows the water stream. Hey, it's me from the future. I'm here to remind you to be safe and to make sure to have an adult with you for this experiment. If you're using a laser pointer, remember it is not a toy. Do not point the laser pointer at anyone. Do not point it at a mirror-like surface or a mirror as it could reflect the laser somewhere dangerous. Okay, that's all. Back to past me for the explanation. So looking at this model of what we just made of the light fountain. So we shine a laser pointer at the stream from the opposite end of the water bottle. And the laser beam travels straight until it reaches the water to air 
interface, so the boundary between two different density mediums. And what, from what we learned before, we would expect the light to refract, to bend. But actually, this is a really special case. And instead of just, you know, bending into the air, it reflects. So this is called total internal reflection. And the result is that the water actually stays, or sorry, the light actually stays inside the water stream. So it's reflected, then it hits another boundary and it is reflected again. And it, this just keeps happening. And this is how the light is trapped within this stream of water. It just keeps being totally internally reflected. So total internal reflection happens in very special, in a very special case. So total internal reflection happens um, only when you meet certain uh, requirements. Total internal reflection happens only when you meet certain requirements. So the first one is that the light has to be traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium. For example, from water to air, like the light fountain. Um, and also the angle at which the light hits the boundary has to be big enough. Um, and so if those two conditions are met, then the light will be totally internally reflected. And this is a super interesting and useful principle um, because you're able to tr basically trap light in a um, stream of water or in a thin tube. And that's really useful for transmitting information. And we really want to use light to transmit information because it's so fast, you know? It's the fastest um, thing in the universe. So if we can use that to transmit information, it will be much faster than, say, electrons that we use now. So that's what fiber optic internet is. So you may have heard about fiber optics. Um, there's a big transition now from cable internet to uh, fiber optic internet. And what has really allowed fiber optic internet to work is total internal reflection. So these wires, they kind of look like regular, or these fibers kind of look like regular wires. Um, but instead of having a copper core, like regular wires that conduct electrons, they have usually a silica or glass core. And that glass core conducts light. So um, if you look at this diagram of the of a example of a fiber optic, um, it has this structure where the core is um, usually silica and there is a something surrounding it called the cladding. So this um, cladding has a density or a refractive index that makes sure that total internal reflection will happen um, to keep the light uh, trapped inside this core. And you see that once the light enters the core, it's totally internally reflected so that it's contained in the core and also transmits in the direction of the fiber. So um, fiber optic internet uses light to transmit these signals instead of electricity or electrons. So let's look at how they compare. Um, is fiber optic really that much better? So optical fibers, again, conduct light whereas copper wires um, for regular cable internet conducts electrons. And fiber optics are able to transmit signal at 69% the speed of light, whereas cable internet transmits signal at less than 1% the speed of light. So that's more than 69 times faster um, than cable internet. 
And on top of that, fiber optic internet is actually also more reliable and more secure. It's less uh, susceptible to different um, natural events that might disrupt cable internet and cause power outages. And also it's more secure because it doesn't use electricity um, where electricity can't be contained just within the wire. It can still, it still transmits some signal that can be detected outside. Whereas light, the light in an optical fiber is completely contained inside the, the fiber and no light can escape. So there's no way that you can measure a fiber optic signal outside of the um, fiber itself. So it's more reliable and more secure. So for our last demo today, we're going to make a sky and a glass. So what you're going to need is a glass of water, or in this case, I have a big pitcher of water. You're going to need a little bit of milk. These are going to act like the gas particles in the atmosphere in the sky. You're going to need something to mix it with and a flashlight to act like the sun. I'm gonna use my phone again. So first thing to do is to add a bit of milk into the water and stir it up. So here the particles of milk floating in the water act like the gas particles that are in the atmosphere. And next we're gonna Turn on the flashlight and shine it on the side. Can you see that the milk water mixture looks kind of blue? So What's happening is that the milk particles are scattering the blue light much more than the other colors of light. And this is also what happens in the sky. Um, the gas molecules in the atmosphere scatter the blue light 10 times more than the um, other colors of light, like red. And so the result is that when we're looking at the sky normally, it looks blue because more of the blue light is scattered and in the sky. But when you're looking at a sunset, it doesn't look blue, it looks yellow or red. And so to simulate that, we can shine the flashlight behind and look directly at the light. It's a bit harder to see on camera, but you should see that the light looks yellow, kind of like a sun at sunset. So I hope you can try this at home so you can really see the big difference um, with your own eyes. But what's happening here is that this ray of light that's from the flashlight, as it's traveling through this milk and water, the blue light is being scattered or bounced off in all different directions. And so by the time it's traveled all the way through this uh, mixture, most of the blue light has been scattered away. So what's left is the red and yellow light. And that's what you see. That's also why um, during sunset, you see a red sun because the light from the sun um, has passed through the atmosphere for a long distance. So all of the blue light, or most of the blue light has been scattered away and what you're left with is just the red sun. So you can also try shining a flashlight beneath the glass. And you can see that from the side view, it looks blue again. But if you look from the top, Again, you can see the red um, 
sunset kind of look. So let's just talk a little bit more about how that happens. So let's talk more about what's happening in the sky in a glass. So we have the glass of water, which we add milk to, and then we shine the flashlight. And when it hits these milk particles, scattering happens. And like I said previously, um, the scattering is dependent on the color or the wavelength of the light. So it scatters blue the most. So there it goes, scatters the blue light, which goes every which direction in the solution and makes the solution look a bit blue. Um, and then since the blue light has been scattered by some of the milk, the light ray from the flashlight becomes more and more yellow um, or red. So it can, um, the light ray can hit another milk particle, scatter more blue light, and become yellow or red. Um, so if you're looking directly into the flashlight, like the eye is showing here, what you see again is the sunset-like yellow um, light coming from the flashlight. And that again is because you're looking directly at the light ray that has had its blue light scattered by the milk water solution. So what's left is the yellow and red light which travel to your eye. Um, so this is like what happens in a sunset. But if you remember the case where we're watching from um, the side, so you're not directly looking at the flashlight, um, ray of light coming from the flashlight, you see that the solution, the milk and water looks kind of blue. And so what you're seeing there is all the scattered blue light um, from the flashlight. But because the flashlight's ray isn't going directly into your eye, you're not really seeing the beam from the flashlight, but you are seeing all of the scattered blue light. And so that's like looking at the sky, um, not during sunset. So again, this is why the sky is blue. Um, so when the sun hits the atmosphere right here, it's white light, so it has all the colors in it, but the gases and small particles in the atmosphere scatter the shorter wavelengths, the blue light and the purple light, much more than the yellow and red light. And so that's what this is showing here. And so there's a lot of extra blue, there's a lot of blue light that's been scattered in the atmosphere to make the sky look blue. But what happens during sunset? Because, you know, beautiful sunsets are all different colors, red and pink and yellow. So it really has to do with the path the sunlight has to take to get to your eyes. So on the left here, you see an example where you're looking at the sky, but it's like afternoon or noontime. And you see that the sun is directly above you. And so the distance it has to travel in the atmosphere to reach your eyes is relatively short. Um, and so there's not enough time or there's not enough distance for the blue light to be scattered so much that the sun looks red. But it is scattered a little because when you look at the sun, in the afternoon, please don't look directly at the sun, it's dangerous. But um, we all know that the sun looks kind of yellow. Um, that's because some of the blue light is being scattered. But if you look at the sunset case, the sun is no longer directly above you. It's to the west, you know, um, by the horizon. And because of that, 
you can see that the light has to travel a much longer distance through the atmosphere to reach your eyes. And so that gives more um, distance, more time for the blue light to all be scattered um, away into the atmosphere. And so the light that reaches your eyes becomes red or pink or whatever color it happens to be. Um, so it's pretty cool that we can simulate the particles in the atmosphere just by mixing milk and water. Okay, so that wraps up my last experiment, but let's talk about um, what we learned today. So from the first two experiments, um, the appearing coin and the switching arrow, we learned about refraction, which is when light bends, when it travels from one medium to another, like from air to water or from water to air. And again, that's because um, the light travels at different speeds in mediums of different density. And we also saw that refraction is what makes stars twinkle and what um, makes mirages happen. Um, and we also learned about total internal reflection with the light fountain. So again, in special cases, the light when it hits a boundary between two mediums like air and water, in certain special cases, instead of refracting, the light will be completely reflected. And um, this is the principle behind fiber optic internet. So you can keep light trapped basically within um, a optical fiber and transmit information basically at the speed of light um, through this fiber using total internal reflection to trap the light. And lastly, we just talked about scattering and why scattering makes the sky blue and the sunsets red. So by scattering the blue light more than the yellow and red light in the atmosphere, um, we see the sky as blue normally, but during sunsets, when the sun light has to travel through more of the atmosphere, most of the blue gets scattered away and we see a red, beautiful sunset. So I hope that you guys had fun um, learning and listening to me. And I hope you guys get to try out some of these experiments on your own and um, see what you can observe. We're going to watch a special message from Dr. John Dudley. He's speaking to us from Paris, France, and he is chair of the UNESCO International Day of Light Committee. And I'm going to share with you his video. My name is John Dudley, and I'm the chair of the International Day of Light Steering Committee. It's my great pleasure to be with you and to give you an overview of the International Day of Light and to present some of our specific objectives for this year, 2021. I'm just going to take a moment now and share my screen and give a short presentation of the International Day of Light. The International Day of Light is an annual observance of the United Nations, UNESCO, to raise awareness of the importance of photonics and light-based technology to achieve the goals of the UN system in areas such as education, well-being, and sustainable development. It was first proclaimed in 2017 and celebrated on May 16, 2018 in Paris. And since then, we've had uh, 2019 and 2020 editions of the celebration that have reached millions of people in more than 80 countries, and even on one occasion, a message from the International Space Station. This is the fourth edition of the International Day of Light. And like every year, the global aim is to promote how science and photonic science in particular 
can aid the United Nations goals in sustainable development. The UN crystallizes its objectives around 17 precise sustainable development goals shown in this slide. They cover broad areas such as addressing poverty, improving health care, ensuring infrastructure is sound and safe. And for us in photonic science, we're in a remarkable position because we can, in a way, contribute to achieving every one of these in, in some form or another. To give some specific examples, the, in the area of addressing hunger, the, the field of agri-photonics is, is uh, uh, a burgeoning uh, area of research and application which uses advanced remote sensing and spectroscopy to assess uh, crop health at a distance. Medical imaging techniques very often are based on photonic science and education now uh, not only requires uh, uh, basic local uh, tools such as affordable lighting to enable children to do study in the evening, but uh, more and more, as we've seen in the last 14 months, our education system has relied upon the fiber optic and communications infrastructure, which is all laser and photonics based. This presentation, for example, would not be possible without the uh, optical fiber internet that uh, connects us all. Other areas where photonics plays a role in development are in solar power, the generation of efficient lighting, the uh, uh, structural monitoring of, uh, infra of, of infrastructures such as bridges and buildings, the, uh, the advanced development and the enabling of the uh, Internet of Things and uh, everywhere connected, smart cities, Environment, envi environmental monitoring to understand climate change and global warming. And uh, on a more uh, general level, photonics and the photonics community have really shown leadership in science in creating a wide range of partnerships that are of benefit to society. The partnership of this International Day of Light, for example, brings together uh, public and private sector institutions universities, international organizations uh, from around the world, all with the aim of consolidating activities on the 16th of May every year. Uh, of course, with the pandemic uh, beginning in 2020, the activities that we had planned for last year were uh, severely uh, impacted, but nonetheless, the enthusiasm of this community is fantastic. We had uh, over, uh, with events were shifted online rapidly, and we had over 300 discrete events in uh, around 80 countries with over 750,000 participants uh, in, in one form or another, with hundreds of thousands of engagements and impressions on social media. This year, many events are also held uh, virtually and online, and we're hoping for very similar global reach. Uh, we have already, as I'm preparing this, this talk, uh, we have uh, events planned in over 50 countries of all sorts, from, uh, from uh, precise, from very focused uh, technical research uh, conferences to online presentations and competitions for young children. So we're looking forward to uh, a lot of success and please check out all our social media channels for, for what's going on. Uh, from a particular perspective of uh, science, the, the date of 16th of May was chosen uh, quite deliberately to celebrate the invention of the laser or the report of its first oscillation is probably more precise on 16th of May uh, in 1960. So this year represents 61 years since laser oscillation was first reported by Ted Maiman. The, the story of the laser is, is, is a wonderful example of how technology and industry work together uh, to, to create tools that are of uh, lasting benefit for the society. But every year brings other achievements into focus. And this, this historical aspect 
of the International Day of Light is really important because it allows us to look at the particular anniversaries that happen on a regular basis. For example, this year, 2021, in photonics represents 60 years of laser nonlinear optics. 30 years since the femtosecond Kerr lens uh, mode locked titanium sapphire was invented. And 30 years since the concept of, of the photonic crystal optical fiber. And events all around the world have or will be celebrating these anniversaries, not only this week for the International Day of Light, but all year. And this is a really important thing that even though the International Day of Light takes place on one particular day, you can associate events all year, providing they meet the goals of the, the International Day. So if you're inspired by anything that you see in the next few days, then please go back to your own organizations, schools or institutions, and you can plan something uh, very similar later in the year, perhaps when things are easier to organize as well. The International Day of Light also reminds us that scientists have regularly shown social leadership in areas that bridge science and society. Charles Towns, for example, uh, worked in numerous ways to help the, the, uh, the government in areas of space exploration uh, and space policy. And Richard Feynman is well known for being involved in, in uh, investigating the, the Challenger disaster in the 1980s and in making some very important comments about how science and technology and uh, political objectives should work together to achieve goals. And from our perspective as individual scientists, we should not forget that we also have a responsibility in this, in this area as well. And this brings me to our 2021 campaign, which is focused on really uh, addressing the problems that we've all noticed in the last uh, year. And if we think about it for an extended period beyond that, where we've seen public confidence and trust slowly but surely decrease in all areas. And we've launched for this year a special campaign called Trust Science that you can read about on the website www.trust-science.org. And I urge you all to look at this because it's a very simple way in which you can make a statement about how you support the, 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 the role of a scientific method and evidence in making decisions and in determining policy. We have science leaders from around the world who have pledged their support. Uh, the many Nobel laureates, former director general of, of institutions such as CERN, presidents of scientific societies, science communicators, science popularizers, students, emeritus scientists from all ages, from all countries, have, have joined together around this common message, which is extremely important. So I, I, I stress again, please have a look at this and uh, please lend your support. It's multilingual and uh, it can be shared with all your, uh, within all your communities. In conclusion, I would like to uh, just wish everyone a fantastic uh, conference and conference event. I would uh, like to uh, express my personal thanks to uh, all the volunteers and scientists who uh, work so hard to make this International Day a success around the world. And I'd like to just remind you all of all the tremendous activities that are on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, which together uh, create a fantastic atmosphere. Uh, I think this weekend of the International Day of Light will be uh, a spectacular example of, of how video conferencing and the internet and social media combine to allow us to join together as a community and to really enjoy a great day of outreach and science. Thank you very much. Science serves humankind. Science attracts us. 
intrigues us. It causes us to wonder, to experiment. Science also makes the comforts and connections of our lives possible. May 16th is the International Day of Light. It's a day when we celebrate light and its impact on art, culture, and in particular, science. The science of light makes cleaner energy possible. It gives us access to clean water. It's made it possible for us to stay connected all over our planet. The science of light is helping us to escape this pandemic. It's helping us to explore the stars and worlds beyond our imaginations. Start celebrating and pledge your support of science, which remains reliable and true. Let's all trust science to make tomorrow better. Pledge your support at trust-science.org and start exploring the science of light and celebrate the International Day of Light on May 16th.